Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome you and call to order the Whatcom County uh, Incarceration Pre Prevention and Reduction Task Force Steering Committee Special Meeting for uh, Wednesday, August 10th, 2022. Uh, welcome. I'm glad we're all getting together to discuss this important topic. I think I'll hand it over to Jill to introduce our, uh, our uh, consultants on this project, and then they will probably be leading us through the rest of the meeting. So Jill? Yes, good afternoon, everyone. I actually am gonna introduce Emily. She is our main point of contact and Sakara, who is our, um, our workhorse in this, I think. So you guys feel free to introduce yourselves. And if you'd like us to go around the room to introduce some of the IPRTF members you haven't met yet, we can, we're happy to do that as well. That would be great. Thanks so much, Jill. Maybe what I can do, hello everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen for a moment and overview our agenda. And then we will introduce ourselves and would love to do introductions with everyone if that's all right as a place to start. So going ahead and sharing here, can folks see this agenda? Great. All right, so thank you so much for spending 90 minutes with us today. We know it's a chunk of time and appreciate the, um, the special meeting. Here's what we're hoping to do. We're gonna start by introducing ourselves. Um, would love to hear from and get to know each of you a bit and understand your roles in this work. Uh, we are going to talk through a vision for success for our work together. So we're gonna talk about our purpose here together in this project, our goals, objectives. We'll start to talk through some of the communications best practices that will guide our work throughout. And then we're gonna go ahead and start to dig into it with you all today. We're gonna to talk through our initial thoughts and recommendations on a communications and community engagement strategy. Uh, we'll talk through an overarching structural framework and some of the key initiatives that we're building our familiarity with in your work. Uh, and then we will dis discuss some specific and timely priorities um, moving forward. So I'll stop there and wanna just first ask before we move into introductions, uh, does that agenda feel good to folks or anything that anyone would add or adjust? Awesome. Okay, that's great. Well, I'll start by introducing myself. I'm Emily Getz. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm a senior vice president at Pyramid Communications and have been there for about a dozen years. I tend to focus on communications and strategy projects um, that are focused in and around Washington State and based on uh, coalition community-driven efforts. Uh, Sakara and I have partnered together for years. Um, I'll be serving as your uh, project manager in this work, so working to keep us aligned on goals and moving forward against them. Um, and Sakara will be serving as the project lead and lead strategist in this body of work. So I'll pass it over to Sakara um, for her introduction. Thank you, Emily. Hello, everyone. Very happy to be here with you. I'm Sakara Remu. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the principal of Temple Water Consulting. And as Emily mentioned, I'm the project lead for this effort. Um, my background, my longest background is also working with coalitions, staffing coalitions, um, and more to the point, communicating what coalitions are accomplishing within their community. So this is definitely within my wheelhouse. We were very excited when this opportunity came up. You all are doing absolutely fantastic work up there in Whatcom County. So excited to um, dig into it with you today. Thank you again. Yeah. Awesome. So we'd love to ask if we could just do a round of introductions for folks that we haven't um, met yet. Um, maybe if it's all right for me to start by just tagging someone. Arlene, can I invite you to introduce yourself? Looks like you are muted still. Okay, uh, my name is Arlene Feld. Uh, I serve on the Law and Justice Systems Committee on um, the Incarceration Reduction and Prevention Task Force. And my background is uh, in mental health care. I'm a marriage and family therapist over 40 years. I worked in the triage program for nine years and that was where I discovered uh, the enormous gaps in our uh, social service and mental health care system. And, I made up my mind that 
I wanted that to change. And so that is the reason for my service on these um, committees. Wonderful, thank you so much. Very nice to meet you. Um, uh, Donnell, can I pass it over to you? Yes, and thanks for having me. I'm Donnell Tanksley. Most people call me Tank. I'm the chief of police in the city of Blaine, Washington. Spent 21 years with the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department in Missouri. Retired there in 2014 and moved to Washington State and started a career in law enforcement here in 2014. And um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Dan, are you up for an intro? Hi, sorry, I'm walking very loud. Uh, Dan Hamill, Bellingham City Council, Ward 3 representative. Uh, that's basically the middle of the city, the downtown core. Um, I'm a co-chair of the Behavioral Health Committee for the um, Incarceration Prevention and Reduction Task Force and had some successes in uh, to, uh, to treat a behavioral health issue. So looking forward to this presentation. Fantastic. Raylene, can we go over to you? Thank you so much. My name is Raylene King. I'm the court administrator for the city of Blaine. I'm the co-chair of the legal and justice subcommittee. I've been involved in criminal justice with the city of Blaine since 1995 and then transferred from law enforcement to the court system in 2005. Fantastic. Um, and Jackie, we've been on email, but we haven't officially met. Hi, I'm Jackie Lasseter. I'm a, a legislative clerk here in the council office, so I help out with uh, staffing these meetings. Fantastic. Um, Stephen, Barry, and Jack, we have been grateful to spend some time with you all already, but want to invite you to share anything that you would before we go ahead and jump in. And Jill as well. No, I'm good. Everybody here knows me, and uh, I, I, we've had a meeting and uh, it's great to get together today. Yeah, I'll just I'll just say our our back chatter has been uh, almost uh, unanimous and in being impressed by how up to speed you two were uh, in our initial conversation and looking forward to moving on from there. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you all so much again for being here. And for moving through introductions, I'm going to share my screen. Can folks see this deck? Yes. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, so we will go ahead and dive into it then. Um, maybe what we can do is just overview what all is included in this presentation, and then um, we'll one, run through it um, in full one time, and then we'll go back and dig in together. We have some questions for you all. We um, hope that you'll have some questions for us and want to move into discussion and get there as quickly as we can with our time today. So just for a quick overview and orientation to what all is included in this presentation, uh, we will start by talking through an overview of the work our um, sense and understanding of our purpose here together, goals and objectives. Um, we'll love to test those assumptions with you all, make any adjustments we need to. We will start to talk through some best practices in communications that will guide our work together. In part two of our discussion today, we're gonna share some initial um, thoughts and recommendations on overarching framing for communications efforts around transforming criminal legal and public safety systems in Whatcom County. We will then talk through some um, key initiatives, um, talk through our understanding of these things and um, how we're thinking about prioritizing moving through them uh, from here. And then in the final portion of our presentation today, we're gonna start to talk through some recommendations around uh, messaging and assets um, and campaigns that we all see, that we see opportunities for you all to move forward with together. And then just finally, um, almost nearly forgot we're going to talk through some initial thoughts on message testing because we know that that's really important to our work together. So that's what we'll be moving through. Um, so we all know what to expect. So starting with an overview of our work together. Uh, Whatcom County has led in Washington State and nationally on a comprehensive and transformative response to community safety. As Sakara mentioned, we have really enjoyed digging into and understanding your work and what has been accomplished to date and um, are incredibly impressed and excited about what's taking place in Whatcom County. 
um, the IPR task force has delivered significant accomplishments since its founding in 2015. And as we understand it to date, those efforts have largely gone unnoticed by Whatcom County. So today we are focused on working alongside community to bring policies, programs, and commitments in the criminal, legal, and public safety systems to reality while continuing to build for the future. Our purpose together um, is centered around the idea that communications and community engagement are tools uh, to bring people together around shared values and a vision for change. So this communications and community engagement plan is for um, the task force use in accomplishing its goal of bringing this work more clearly into view for Whatcom County residents and engaging them in the path forward. It is designed to offer a guide and framework. Um, big part of what that means is that it's designed to be flexible and continue to serve as the task force focus and priorities grow and change in the time to come. In our discussions to date, um, we understand Whatcom County and the IPRTF's communications and community engagement goals to uh, be to build comfort and fluency with communications and community engagement. Um, so it's naturally integrated into your workflow and everything that you're doing. Um, and to identify channels, opportunities, and strategies to really support engagement between the task force and Whatcom County residents with the ultimate purpose of increasing awareness, understanding of Whatcom County's commitment to transforming its criminal, legal, and public safety systems to increase awareness and understanding of success, but also challenges to date um, and, real, and build public will for the path forward. Um, our objectives with this specific body of work are primarily focused around creating that communications and community engagement structure that supports your success and creating a narrative frame and some core messaging that can be brought to life through communications and community engagement moving forward. So that's, that's our primary focus in the work. Um, we did want to start by sharing some best practices. These are things that guide our work um, based on our experience, and they will be central to everything that we do and create together is the idea that, um, that we want to always be communicating with clarity, consistency, and simplicity. We know that a message has to reach and engage someone several times before it really starts to sink in, before someone is able to retain that message and you know easily repeat it, share it with others. Um, we want to focus on leaning into what we know, in other words, the facts, um, because the fact is, is that the task force has been incredibly successful, and by sharing what's taking, what's taken place and the facts, we can build support. Um, we want to offer an opportunity to engage with every communication. This was the most important thing that I learned from Sakara in our early work together, um, was that you, ne you never communicate something without offering an opportunity for people to engage in it and or take action. So every communication is an opportunity. Um, and we always want to be pointing back to the why. And that's this idea of this overarching values-driven framing by continually reminding our audiences why we're doing this work, we can build values-based connections. And it's easier for people to see themselves in it. It's easier for people to align to it. It's easier for people to wanna pay attention to it, retain it. Um, so move through that pretty quickly. Before we move into overarching framing, um, just wanna um, stop and see any questions or comments um, in that overview so far. And we will do deeper discussion um, too. Uh, once we move through the full deck, but want to make sure we catch any thoughts if they're top of mind. Awesome. Then we will go ahead and move forward into overarching framing. I'll pass it over to Sakara. Thank you, Emily. So can you go back to the previous slide, the first yellow slide? Yes. Yeah. Emily and Sakara, I'll just note that Mike Parker has joined us. Mike's a co-chair, and I don't think you've met Mike before, so you may want to check in with him. Hi, sorry I was a little late. I've, I've been running from meeting to meeting, but I, I tuned in as, as you all were covering things, and I, I really like what I'm hearing for um, so far. Um, 
my day job, I work at Opportunity Council. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I'm really passionate about behavioral health and, and trying to keep those people that don't need to be in jail out of the system. So welcoming to you guys. I'm excited about what I'm hearing. And you already answered one of my questions, which is, you know, how do we use these as a way to invite? Because one of our one of our missions of the task force is knowing the subject that we're dealing with. And I personally haven't experienced that in my life. We need to invite more participation in our process. It, it, it's part of our racial equity goals. And so I love that your communications just have that in there already. So I just want to say you preemptively answered my question, which is about how do we invite participation in what we're doing and, and to not appear like we have the answers. And, and you guys are hitting that. So let me know if I can help, but I'm just going to listen. Thank you. Okay. So part two of this deck. Uh, introduces overarching messaging framing for the work that Whatcom County is engaged in. This is kind of the beginning of the structure of the house that you're building, all of your relevant initiative messaging within. And that overarching messaging framing is the what you're doing, which is transforming the criminal legal and public safety systems in Whatcom County. Next slide. So to create uh, overarching framing messaging, we wanna pay attention to these key points that we have a very clear, compelling and consistently reinforced overarching frame for the work that will help residents connect to it and support our ability, your ability to build unity around a big picture Big picture visioning is really important in this kind of transformative work where you can have, um, you know, um, competing priorities um, is just part, part and parcel of doing human services, public health and public safety work. But aligning around a big picture is what often keeps people driving forward. It's important that that big picture is values driven um, and connects the dots for the audience. So they feel like that's very relevant, not just to their surroundings, but to their actual lives and the lives of people they care about in their community. And with each initiative specific, you have quite a few um, ongoing initiatives now, but with each initiative specific moment and milestone, What's important is to first explain what it is and then connect it back to the why. Next slide. So what we're showing you here is kind of the basic um, three components of baseline overarching framing, the what. Whatcom County is transforming our approach to public safety from a system focused on incarceration to one investing in community safety and health. The supporting messages. This one's kind of wordy, but it's probably messaging that you're very familiar with because we've been pulling from uh, a lot of the information that you already have on the website, your various reports since 2016 and descriptions of programming but it's very simple and it's the same message everywhere that um, has hit that critical mass that people are starting to pay attention to. Too often, individuals in crisis, whether a mental health crisis or chemical dependency, are taken to jail or the emergency room. Neither are equipped to serve their needs. Whatcom County has invested time, attention, and resources to changing our approach. Today, we are focused on improving service to people with mental health and substance use disorders. When we connect people experiencing a mental health crisis or substance use disorder to treatment and community supports, rather than incarceration, we get to better outcomes for community members in need, save taxpayers millions of dollars each year and improve public safety for all. So within there, you have the what, the why, and then the last portion is proof point background, kind of the because. Between 1970 and 2014, the number of people in jail in Whatcom County grew almost ninefold, while the overall county population only grew two and a half times. 
In 2021, jail bookings for people involved in the task force programs dropped by 84% and emergency department visits dropped by 62%. So that is your elevator pitch, baseline framework messaging of the what, the why, and the because. I'll stop right there and see if, and again, we'll have more time to dig into this, but is there any immediate thoughts, questions, reactions? Uh, I have something to say. <clears throat> um, this is Dan Hamill again, um, Bellingham City Council. I think, so since the task force began, things have really changed um, in Whatcom County. And what you're seeing there, that that's that first um, 1970 to 2014 that predates um, a number of different things. One, it, the Blake decision. Two, um, booking restrictions at the jail. So the people that are in in Whatcom County's jail right now are largely um, very violent offenders or dangerous. Um, they they're in there on assault charges and things that are not related to some of the things that were brought up earlier here, where we're talking about incarcerating, we're preventing people who have like a substance use disorder or a mental health issue from getting into the jail. It's like our work has been kind of done for us to some degree because of these uh, external factors. <clears throat> um, and then the, the last one, the 2021 jail bookings for people involved with the task force programs dropped by 84%. I don't know if that means <clears throat> like grace and lead programs, but a lot of that is that the jail's not taking people. The jails, it, they're, they're full. And so our police officers, um, commonly do not take people to jail because there's, they will just get turned away. <clears throat> there was a, um, an incident um, a few days ago where a, a man went over the counter at the post office downtown and um, with a knife and was threatening employees. And our police went in and you know arrested him. Uh, and they said that they, they had to quote unquote beg the jail to take him. That's where we're at right now in Whatcom County. Um, I, and I say all of that to make sure that we're all on the same page here when we're talking about messaging because there's a there's an alternate message that you know other things besides the task force have really limited those nonviolent offenders and um, crime crimes of poverty um, being committed. Um, however, I, I say all that uh, with the notion in mind that um, there will be probably a, a jail initiative on the ballot next November and um, voters might vote for it. And so I think we do need to be prepared when we have a bigger facility or a different facility to have some influence on the services and programs um, that, that can be offered there. So I look at the work that we're doing now as setting the table for, for them. So just want to chime, in, to chime in and say that. I appreciate that very much. It might be helpful, um, Jill, if you were to talk about, and Mike, I see you have your hand up as well. Um, we're very cognizant of the issues and challenges with the jail and the priority of it becoming uh, a ballot issue. But Jill, it might be helpful for you to talk about why we've separated out that nuance of work from this current scope of work. Yeah, sure. Um, our legal counsel, Dan, has, she's concerned that, um, any of this communications work should not look too much like campaigning because that's something that's that's going to be prohibited. So I think we really wanted to focus on the facts of what the IPRTF has done and the services um, and the focus of the IPRTF, which really has been on providing programs and support regardless of where the facility is or what the facility is. So um, that's going to be more the purview, I think, of the stakeholder advisory committee and their efforts there. So that's we've got a little bit of a Chinese wall going up between those two efforts for those reasons. Mike. As I was listening to Dan, I was thinking, boy, that's great when you kind of stress test the message, right? And like see how it could be taken differently and that's not where my brain was going but I love that thinking about it because that's what you want to do you want to take your positive message to be like can anybody twist this on us in a way really easily um, and by the way I'm no expert in this so I got to tell you I'm just, I'm just drooling this is amazing so um, with that um, with that accolade 
what, when I think about in the supporting messages, why, and this is just a, a amusing that I have, um, when we connect people experiencing mental health crisis or substance use disorder, um, and, and the use of the word crisis. And, and one of the things that I think is that, well, sometimes it's not people like in a crisis in that moment, that their crisis is kind of a low level crisis. It's one of poverty of constantly being homeless for 20 years and you have to steal to live on the street or you're involved in, in really crimes of poverty, right? And maybe at that moment, I mean, does that make sense? I, when I think yeah. crisis as a public community member, I think, well, this person's freaking out. And actually what may happen on that given day is somebody is in crisis, that's why they're stealing or that's why they got involved in a bad situation. And so I just wondered if, if that word crisis, it, not that it's too strong, but that it's so specific. Because mm -hmm. I, I think we're also, I, I, what people commonly think of as crisis, and I think that the crisis of everyday living when you're mm -hmm. houseless, mm -hmm. they're both crises in their own way, but there's definitely a public perception of crisis mm -hmm. is very, very extreme. And there's also the, the crimes of every day. So I just wonder what y'all think about that in your message testing and, and understanding about where, where people are going to go when they see that. And I does it then say it's true to, to what we're doing? I think that is a very important nuance that you're pointing out because it also speaks to the uh, miseducation that people with mental health issues are violent. And so crisis to some people could just mean that, oh, they're in a crisis means they're being violent. Um, so we will refine that. Steven? Thanks, Sakara. Um, <clears throat> First of all, I, I really appreciate the chance we have to bounce back and stress test this with you. Um, uh, so thank you. Um, I, I think you have come to appreciate the activities of the task force that, that are substantial. One of the things I've most appreciated about my time on the task force is the learning that's gone on um, that's a little bit harder to communicate. And um, that's part of what I would like to communicate to the public and, and, and infuse in their understanding so that the, the two-way communication is, is as informed as possible. And if we don't do that, um, we risk setting up some expectations that may not be as realistic as, as I, I, for one, would like. So, one thing I would say is in the primary message language you have, um, I, I think the nuance in our learning is that we're, we're realizing we have to find a balance between community safety and um, uh, health, um, mm -hmm. rather than just investing in, in that one side of it. Um, and, and I think this brushes up against some of the concerns Dan was articulating um, but but uh, addresses them outside of a of a campaign kind of context. But it but it is the truth of what we're wrestling with. And I think it's it when when we look for a, a, an overarching framework, um, uh, I think the community doesn't yet have consensus on that. I, I I think finding that balance is is sort of where we're at, and maybe where we're at for a long time. Um, uh, so, and, and, and part of that is, I think we're realizing it's not an either or between incarceration or treatment, because there are a lot of people with mental health or substance use disorders, crisis or no, um, who uh, most of us would agree need to be incarcerated. Um, so, uh, that's a factor in that in that more nuanced balance kind of thing. I, I think also right now the community as a whole that we'll be communicating with uh, thinks that if we provide treatment, mental health or substance use disorder treatment, that's an alternative to incarceration and it will solve the problem. Increasingly, the task force has come to understand that there are other factors that the professionals call criminogenic factors 
you can provide all the treatment you want. If you don't, if you don't burrow down into those, you're going to have continued criminal activity or a higher risk of continued criminal activity. And I don't know how to communicate something that that subtle uh, um, to the community, but it seems important in what the expectations are because I think the expectations in the community right now are set at let's beef up treatment alternatives and then we can reduce incarceration and we can uh, reduce crime activity. And I, I'm not sure we are as confident of that as we all were when we started out on this path. Okay, thank you. Raylene and then Arlene. Um, I think you're muted. I was trying to find my spot so I could unmute myself. I guess my concern is kind of following along with Dan's concerns and the the numbers. I mean, it sounds wonderful that we've done all these things, and and I think a lot of the things we have done are wonderful. But I I have a hard time believing that our programs have dropped it by that percentage due to COVID and the lack of being able to book people with problems with the jail. I understand not wanting to put this on a, a political platform and I respect that because I don't think that's what we wanna do. But when the judge is saying, I want the police to book this guy, he needs to be back in jail. It's a DV charge and having to tell him I don't think the jail's going to do it. They don't have the space. There's restrictions. They're taking DV new arrests, but I don't know that we can do this. We can pass it on. We can send it off. But, you know, we've got all these people waiting that have been there for years because of trials not going forward. That to say it's because of all the wonderful work we've done, I, I just, it's hard for me to to agree on. Arlene. Yes, um, this is making me think about, try to think about um, the value. What What's the value uh, that matters the most in this situation because there are so many um, competing needs. But to me, for me personally, the value is about providing uh, the care and support that is needed for our community. And that by doing that, it also uh, helps us uh, change the emphasis uh, from punishment to re restoration of people. Uh, so the original value in my opinion is, is much broader than the either or of treatment or jail. But the fact that our community does not have much of what it needs in order to provide mental health assistance to people, it's lacking. And that makes more people go to jail that don't need to go to jail and shouldn't go to jail necessarily because they never have been able to get the care that they needed in our community or they have to wait too long and they keep falling through the cracks over and over again. So we're looking at uh, providing the care that's needed and the support that's needed to stay stable, to stay emotionally uh, stable and sober. And uh, so to me, you know, that's the angle that I'm coming from. But as far as uh, the jails are concerned, um, there's a new wind blowing and it's blowing across our country and probably across the world of changing um, from a punishment system to a restoration system as far as criminal justice is concerned to mm -hmm. do it, to be able to do it whenever possible mm -hmm. and the proof of that in our experiments here is the mental health court 
um, in the juvenile court because that's a step in the direction of not incarcerating people, but attempting to help them with their problems that create the difficulty in the first place. Or in other words, getting at the source of problems and not just at the end products of them. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm not sure, is that, do you understand what I'm saying? I do understand. Emily, can you go back two slides? Uh, I'm sorry, forward one more, just to the top line. There we go. Um, and Mike? What I was going to add is, you know, I think your wording, um, which which I took, and but it sounds like it, other people could take another way. When you said people involved involved in the task force programs have have really caused that reduction. So that, to me, led me to believe, okay, we're being very specific. We're not trying to say we reduce the overall population. We're saying Correct. involved in the programs that we're doing. So I, I think that would need to be bright um, to make sure that people catch that. The second concept, and, and because you guys are so good at words and I'm already impressed with what I'm seeing, another thing that I've gotten as a task force member is this concept of making sure that the people that are in jail are the people that need to be in jail and the people that need treatment and need care and need housing and need the other things are not. And I don't have a good way to say that. And Arlene, as you were talking, I was thinking that, boy, that is one of the learnings that I've had is that it, much like Stephen said, we, we understand that there are people committing crimes that are really pretty dangerous. And at the moment, the safest place for them and for us is in a, in a jail facility that is focused on rehabilitation, right? Not just incarceration, but they're also unsafe at that time. And that in the past, maybe not now because of COVID as you're hearing and the other stresses on our, on our jail, we're not probably jailing the people who don't need to be there. As a matter of fact, we're not really jailing anybody else other than violent offenders. So there's that kind of message like we were chartered. We maybe were in that situation where there were many of us in the task force thinking that there were people in jail that really didn't need to be there. And that situation has shifted. So how do we navigate where, you know, where, where that changed underneath us, so to speak. So I think I'm hearing two things and Emily chime in as well. Um, and Dan, I see your hand as, as well. Um, I'm a very frank communicator. So if this is extremely blunt, I apologize. So I'm hearing, I'm hearing two things. I'm, what I'm hearing from you all is there is a crisis right now that you want tools to be able to communicate the nuances of to community. What we were contracted for is not necessarily that per se. So, but that doesn't mean that we don't have an opportunity to get into that with some of the things that we would be recommending be developed that can get into the nuance of not just what has Whatcom County done, what has the task force done, but what is the circumstance right now? That's important to the relevance right now. So I trust me, right now, Emily is taking fast and furious notes on everything that you are saying so that we can figure out one, what is relevant to overarching messaging framing, which is the broadest brushstroke, which is why I took us back to this first slide to get to kind of what Arlene was touching on of the value. What is it that we are overall doing for the health and wellness for community and for people to have an opportunity for health and prosperity, which is what we want all Washingtonians to have. So we, we hear that, we get that. And then what we need to also separate out from that, but figure out how to bring in as we are developing actual assets for messaging is what is the present nuanced circumstance of the main challenges with the jail? Who is incarcerated there and why? Does that sound like I'm hitting it, I'm, 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 I'm in the ballpark here of what we're hearing? Okay. Dan, did you have another comment? Well, I think it's just to, to your point, um, 
I th you know, I, I think things have changed or the context has changed uh, locally here. And I just want to be aware of that. Um, um, so, so, sorry, something's at my door. Okay. Um, the, oh, they have a key, never mind. Um, I'm just saying that things have changed since we started this work in 2015. Um, it was a result of the jail uh, measure failing. And then two years later, it failed again. I'm the only city council to vote twice against that interlocal agreement because they were terrible. And I didn't want to put people um, in jail unnecessarily unless they committed some kind of like, you know, what as Stephen said, criminogenic kind of behavior. But that's changed now. And I, I just want us to be aware of the, um, for example, on the substance use disorder uh, front, fentanyl has, uh, cartel fentanyl has made a huge impact on our community. And uh, it results in property crimes and behaviors that are um, un, unwelcome, I guess. Um, it's not that the, and I look the, at the person not as a homeless person or a drug addict, I look at them as a patient. And the patient is not getting better. And it's to Arlene's point earlier that we need the treatment options. And then in the context though, is that we don't have those in, in a meaningful way. We need a broader treatment um, community or ecosystem and we don't have that. And so, and because we're like a recommending body, we're not like a, a body that can say, okay, we're gonna give some person, some organization millions of dollars to start up a treatment program. We can recommend that um, I just want us to be aware that the context has really shifted. It's the pendulum has swung from defund the police back to, you know, my constituents proper uh, e-bike e got stolen and now they want, and the cops aren't doing anything. And, you know, things like that. I think it's just that it's just this mix. It's uncharted waters is what I'm saying. And I want to just be totally aware and sensitive to that. And I don't want us to get into a, you know, like we're communicating in, in favor of a new jail or against it or whatever. I don't know. That's not my point. I just wanted us to be able to talk about the really good work that the task force has done. And we have done really good work with, we recommend it, we, we worked on Grace, we worked on LEAD. We, the alternate response team, which is an unarmed response came out of Mike's in my committee. Um, so we don't send a badge and a gun, we send a nurse and a DCR. That's a good thing. So no, you know, that person's not gonna get shot that day because no one showed up with a gun. So I think that there's super positive things and I wanna make sure we're talking about them. But context is important. I'll stop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's, uh, oh, shit. Looks like I might be. Steven while you're... Yeah, go ahead, Stephen. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, Sakara, I really appreciate the way you delineated the, the, the contract goal, uh, and and what you're hearing here. I, I think all I would supplement that with is is what I said before. I think there are, as Dan said, there are a lot of concrete actions we have taken that have made a very positive difference, and I think that's why you and Emily are impressed and we feel good about the work we've done. But it's also why I am I emphasize my earlier comment that there's, I'd like to communicate the learnings or that context so that expectations are realistic and, and the, the public can sort of follow along with both the successes and the barriers or the, the bigger questions uh, of the context that we're facing. We, we can, funnel all sorts of money into initiatives for treatment programs. But then the question is, okay, who's gonna provide those treatment services? Well, the workforce isn't there to do that. So it, it's gonna go more slowly than a lot of people think. And I think, I think that's stunned many of us to, to realize just how hard it is to actually implement some of these values that we have. And I'd like the public to understand that too, so uh, so they don't get impatient, so they don't get oppositional, so they don't say, well, a treatment emphasis isn't gonna work, let's go back to sticking people in jail. I, I just, uh, I, I call it learning, uh, Dan called it context, and, and 
as, as long as some of that is conveyed in some of the messaging, and it may not be in the in the primary value statement or the what, um, but it ought to come through someplace in in some of the sub messaging uh, specificity. That's all. Okay. Thank you, Raylene. Thank you. Kind of going back to what Dan was saying on the shifting and the changing when one of the programs was started with friendship diversion services with the task force um, bellingham was the first on the bandwagon and then blaine joined and then everson and sumas and and when we started with that that was so that we had alternatives for people that didn't need to be in jail and, and i think the numbers were reflecting that and that was positive like we were able to keep them working and keep them going to school and still have consequences for some of their actions. And then as time goes on and all of this other stuff happens, the FDS contracts are being picked up by some of the other agencies because they don't have any other options for consequences to their actions because we can't use the facilities that was there for those purposes. So now we've got, it used to be as an alternative and now is it our only option? And that's where I'm seeing some of the shift and we don't know if that option is gonna work for every individual. And then you're gonna have frustration with the good stuff that we were doing became not an alternative, but a necessity. Okay, Arlene, and then I think we'll move to the next section. Um, I would re really like this messaging process to help move obstacles out of our path. Mm -hmm. By that, I mean, um, we know that there are certain elements in our population who already are resistant to something or other that we're going to be proposing. So I would really like the the messaging to be able to address that ahead of time, get it out of the way, so to speak, so that we can go forward with the proposals that we're making. Um, I think that there is um, negativity on the jail, uh, on rebuilding a jail, and that we need to get that out of the way because we, do, we know we need a jail. And so the information about that has to be uh, formed in, in a way that people can understand it simply and uh, clearly. And with the additional information that we're proposing to do things while people are in jail to help them not have to come back to jail. Um, I think to address uh, the difficulty in staffing is to create an obstacle in our own path. Um, we don't need that obstacle. We know this is a problem, but we also know that if you uh, incentivize people, they will come and take those jobs or we can recruit in other places if we have to. It doesn't have to all be local people doing this. People are coming here from other areas. Um, but mainly that's about, a lot of times it's about salaries. Salaries have to be correct. They have to be sufficient to attract people. And that way you also can get the best people. So I wanna, so I would like to see uh, addressing, looking at, you know, where is the resistance gonna come from? And one of them, one of the resistances is the, uh, as far as public safety is concerned, is that people are all excited about uh, increasing crime. Whether that's true or not, that's what is talked about. If you look at the, at the, the neighborhood, um, uh, I forget what you call those uh, 
programs or, or apps that are coming up all the time. Everything is about something that happened to somebody in their neighborhood. We also know that a, a lot of petty crime is, has to do with addiction and getting enough money for your, for your next dose. Mm -hmm. we have a, we've always had a lot of petty crime. Um, the stuff that's on your porch or whatever it is, your the lights in your in your yard and so forth. So you've got to put out information that will help people understand what's you know what's really going on and not going on, as opposed to just you know um, the shocking things. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Thank you. That was extremely helpful. Emily, can we move to messaging framework? So one of the things that we are developing for you is a messaging framework for key initiatives. Uh, that you all had developed previously um, to start to figure out how to communicate these things to the broadest audience possible. So not other service providers, not people that, you know, are wonky and familiar with the lingo and all of the acronyms, but your common everyday folks, some who may be directly impacted by these issues and others that may not necessarily be, be so or consider themselves to be so. Next slide. So we're recommending building a narrative communications framework that leads with the overarching framing, which we just, just discussed, transforming these systems in Whatcom County, and then features core initiatives and priorities that deliver on the overarching framing's vision for change in your community. Just place-based solutions are critical. And additional core initiatives and priorities can be added to the structure over time as this work grows and changes. Um, so based on the meeting that we had with the leadership of the um, steering committee, we have you know, you originally came to us and said, oh, we'd like maybe campaigns for two to four things. And we've kind of broken that down a little bit further. It's actually five things that you're messaging. You're messaging the overall, the overarching messaging. What are we doing? Transforming criminal, criminal and legal public systems in Mockham County. And within that, there is the IPR task force itself. There's mental health and substance use disorder response alternatives to incarceration and community health services. So uh, next slide. So we've heard everything that you've said um, from the previous section. So I'm actually gonna go through this pretty quickly with the understanding that we're gonna be adjusting language and focus here, but we do want to clarify for you what this um, key initiative messaging framing is and looks like. It's very similar to what you just saw on the overarching messaging slides. Uh, the primary message is for the IPR task force is the Whatcom County Incarceration Prevention and Reduction Task Force is a countywide coalition of community members working to reduce incarceration and increase community safety and health. So ignoring everything else that is on that slide, how does that feel for a top line values driven overarching messaging about the work of the IPR task force for regular common community member folk. Jack? It's fine. I would include, when you say community members, for some people, just the connotation of that wouldn't include elected officials and others. So I would expand on how you describe it is, and we are all community members, whether you're an elected or something else, 
But one of the unique features of this task force is everyone who needs to be at the table is at the table, mm -hmm. which includes um, all the people that you know. So that would be my one comment. And I'm going to give you a quick comment on supporting messages. You say that's why we formed the task force when we get there. I would say that's one of the reasons. If you look at the original ordinance, that's not, uh, in fact, that was in the original ordinance, a not as major a part. I think it's probably accurate now, but if we're going to say, we could say it's why we have the task force, but for formed, it's a little different. Thanks. Thank you. Arlene? Yeah, that, um, the, the same words concern me as well, maybe for different reasons, but um, this is not just community members on this task force. These are the leaders in the community and these are people in power positions for the most part. There's some exceptions to that, but the majority of people have, uh, and I don't know how to say that in a way that's not offensive <laughs> to the public, but it's, I don't think we should be untruthful. Agreed. I'm going to counterpoint that. I love that darn thing. I think there's an egalitarian piece that, that, that appeals to me um, because I think when we're here, people of leadership position or not, members of the task force, or in my case, not, are really all heard and there's spots for all. Um, may, maybe there's a way though, I think Jack has a good point too. I mean, you certainly want to call out that um, um, there's some well-informed community. I mean, however we tease that out, I just want to just provide a counterpoint that I think some of the messaging to the community that these are all ordinary citizens like yourself, we may hold different positions, but that appeals to me. So I just want to provide that counterpoint and yeah, I, I will just add to that. I definitely think we can find the balance of adding a sentence in there to give a little bit of nuance of, of who is represented, but we chose to focus on the word coalition for a reason, because we're trying to appeal to the broadest audience possible and coalition messaging is something that things gravitate to when people hear the word coalition I mean, it, it, it literally means people from different walks of life at different levels, doing different things, coming together for the common good. And so we also want to be careful to not, uh, you know, some facing people or joining, joining people in a meeting that are in positional power can feel very daunting to people who are coming in. And so since we want to start building that, that invitation of opportunity to engage, we want to make sure that it feels like this is this is for who is there and this is for whomever wants to come and join along and learn more. But we will build on that. Stephen, did you have another comment? Yeah, I don't want to get too deep into wordsmithing, but I, I, I like Jack's point and I would just suggest that we say coalition of community members and public officials. Uh, uh, because that, that de-emphasizes the power and emphasizes at least a nuance of accountability to the community members by being public officials. Great idea. Thank you. And, okay, so in building on uh, IPF task force messaging, Emily, can you go to the next slide? I'm mindful of the time we have left. We have uh, the history of the work here, which was something uh, that I think in our previous meeting, folks wanted, it, wanted us to make space for what the task force is, why it was brought together, the history and accomplishments of the work, and then the future of the task force, and then as well as how to engage in the task force. So that's what these um, slides recommend. Words can change, but this is the overall structure of messaging that we will be um, creating for IPR uh, task force. Incarceration and Prevention Reduction Task Force has worked since 2016 to increase resources to address underlying causes of incarceration in order to lead people out of the criminal legal system and into intensive case management services reducing the chances of incarceration, of reincarceration. 
how does that feel for just the very top line? Again, let's, for the time being, ignore supporting and proof points. It's, it's a pretty uh, pretty complex sentence structure to communicate to the, to the public. So I'd say that first of all. Um, I'd also say that I think there's more than just increasing resources because in some cases we've had to create systems or programs or something like that. So there, there's that element too, that if we could add that in somehow would be would be helpful. Jack? I would probably chop the sentence. I would say it's worked since 2016 to address underlying, underlying causes of incarceration, to lead people out of the criminal legal system and reduce chances of incarceration. And I would eliminate address underlying causes and eliminate intensive case management services, unless we're trying to limit this statement to that scope. It's true we're doing those things, but that's not the entire scope of what we're doing. Okay, got it. Dan? Um, I think one thing is missing for me that, I don't know, I mean, it just seems like it's such a central piece to the work that we do is like, for me, this, I'll just speak for myself. I, I am fully into dismantling a, a system that's based on white supremacy and um, has has um, incarcerated uh, black and brown people and, and indigenous folks um, far too often. Um, and, and a lot of the work that we do provides like an equity um, lens or piece for that. Um, uh, Raylene brought up the, um, the the ankle bracelet program, the electronic home monitoring program that absolutely kept people out of the, out of jail. And that was one of the first things that we did um, to reduce the um, disparities when it comes to to that. So I just, I, I don't know. I don't know if it, if, if it's, it should fit in within this framework, but I do think that we need to talk about that in our messaging, that that's a, that's a, I mean, we have the, the GARE, the, the Government Alliance on Racial Equity toolkit that um, Mike Parker's championed so much. Prosecutor Eric Ritchie, the lead program that sort of came out of here, at least members of this group, that's one of the primary focuses is to, to reduce the um, disparities within the system. So I don't know, I don't know where it fits, but I just wanted to throw that out there. It fits perfectly in our next slide. Okay, sorry. Emily, <laughs> no, it's perfect timing, perfect segue. Okay, uh, so we started with, uh, as a key accomplishment, the Ann Deacon Center for Hope. But then uh, to your point, Dan, we'd like to fill in a bit of a benchmark timeline between 2016 and 2022 to develop those very things that you all have just been talking about. What are some you know, key critical things that have been implemented um, in Whatcom County like um, ankle bracelets? Dan, are you, are you asking for content here? Uh, yeah, I'm asking for reactions and, and content and ideas from anybody about what you think are some of the strongest bench points of accomplishments. Uh, I would say alternate response team that came out of the behavioral health um, subcommittee that would have been um, in 2020, we started talking about it and then the then COVID hit. And so it, it didn't get, it's it's being implemented now. So it would be a 2022 thing, I guess. Um, the lead program would be like a 2021 program. And then Grace, I think would be like a 2019 program. And and Jill's gonna know all the timing on this more than okay. than I would. I think COVID's fried my my memory when it comes to re remembering stuff when things happen. But those are, those are really good um, takeaways, or I'm sorry, really good, um, I think messages that we need to kind of explain to the community that we did all those things. And I think EHM, that was I, 2015 or 2016, probably 20, what 2016. What is EHM? Oh, I'm sorry, electronic home monitoring. Oh, thank you. 
Dan, Sorry, when, when you were mentioning alternative response, you know, another thing I was thinking of is co-responder, right? Yeah. And obviously we, yeah. yeah, and I don't know if that's different enough and maybe Scar and Emily can weigh in on that, you know, for we us. We co-responder in there for sure. Well, oh. the, the differences are salient, right? In, in, in certain jurisdictions, we're gonna be able to have the alternative response team you had. And then in our rural areas, it really became quite clear that we really needed a co-responder program mm -hmm. because the time it would take for law enforcement to get there. So we really kind of have both things kind of came up. I just don't know if the difference is salient enough to the public, but it, but I would, yeah, I would just say that kind of alongside that, alternative response team was also this recognition of like, wow, we need co-responders in certain jurisdictions as well. Fantastic. Stephen? Sakara, I'm sorry, I'm a little slow on the uptake here, but I'd like to refer back to the prior slide and sure. uh, really uh, uh, vote in favor of Dan's addition that the primary message um, address our, our emphasis on uh, reducing racial disparities in the system. Um, that was one of the key Vera Institute findings. I think the task force has been a catalyst for that being addressed officially in, in county government and, and in the criminal legal system. I mean, that, that's where a lot of the attention uh, really took seed and it's, it's become part of our framework for doing this work. I, I, think, I think it would, I think it would be valuable for community messaging to to show the emphasis we place on that because I think they do too. Awesome. Raylene. Sorry, I forgot to lower my hand. Oh, okay. Jill. Thank you. I just want to um, point out that in addition to the alternate response from City of Bellingham and the co-responder program for the county, both of those agencies have also invested in um, officers and deputies who are specialized in behavioral health response. So it's almost a third prong there. We want that too. Yeah. Dan? Um, not sure where it fits uh, into the timeline, but I think it was 2017 or 2018 when Ann Deacon, Barry Buchanan, Councilmember Buchanan, and myself <clears throat> received, and then some others who are not on the task force, um, received a MacArthur Foundation grant. We, it was a very competitive grant, and we were um, it was we were uh, just a handful of, were selected, and th they sent us all over the country to San Francisco, D.C. Um, Philadelphia to to meet with other groups um, to to look at um, it was young adult incarceration prevention especially young black men and we were able to have our eyes opened up when it came to um, what other communities do so it was more of an educational um, experience but but that was a result based on the work that we did on the task force up until that point so I, I just want to put that on the table as something like as an accomplishment, but also as a learning tool that we were able to bring back that information and question things like our, our pre-trial uh, risk assess assessment tool. I came back from DC and said, I don't wanna do this thing. I heard from a hundred um, uh, community of color groups um, uh, that said no to this. They don't, didn't want that. So it was really like it forced us to have these conversations and, and uh, go with a different, um, uh, risk assessment tools. I, I think it has some merit. It's a little wonky, but it's something that we did. Okay, cool. Thank you. Emily, can you go to the next slide? And next slide. Should we should we include drug court and mental health court in this list? We certainly can. Did you? We can. I mean, they go back. They go back well before they the go task far, force. They go back farther. Yeah. I think they've been been here before the task force. Okay. The only thing that I don't recall hearing is, did we put the crisis triage center in there? Well, we already had crisis uh, crisis triage before, but a crisis stabilization, which was the expansion. Yeah, that's an accomplishment, yeah. definitely. 
It was I think they mentioned that the Ann Deacon Center for Hope. Yeah, that you know, that's that's what I was going to mention. There's some confusion when you call it the Ann Deacon uh, because that's not well known that it's called that. Right, it's right. always referred to it as a crisis stabilization facility. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, we'll talk about that too. Yeah, because that that was a big expansion of uh, of uh, beds, and that's what one of the things that's certainly missing. So we have about 15 minutes left and uh, still quite a bit of content left. But Emily, I'm wondering with this feedback that we've gotten so far, if we move to uh, section four. Absolutely. I think that's all right. Let's sense. do that. All right. So I I touched on this a little bit earlier, but you know, when you first came to us and in the RFP, uh, you asked roughly for two to four campaigns. And as I said in the previous section, we really looked at five things messaging wise that needed to be developed over our team messaging and in those categories of initiatives and programs. And so now we're going to get into kind of two sets of recommendations, recommendations for messaging and the assets related to, and then messaging specific to what could be campaign worthy and what the assets would be for those. So next slide. So for overarching messaging, we are recommending that we create an overarching visual brand for the work so that it is recognizable wherever it shows up in whatever form, print, pixel or otherwise. Create a centralized location. We've talked to Jill about this um, on the website where some messaging lives and the community is kept abreast of this work. Revising content on the task force webpage in the short term to align with that approach. Creating fact style content that ties to key initiative content and then increasing content access points on the county website. And the simplest way to describe that is, we look at what gets the most traffic on the county's website uh, that relates to these issues and add an access point there for people to be able to quickly click over. Um, so, uh, okay, next slide. So this is messaging and assets, which is separate than campaign and assets. For the IPR uh, task force, uh, as you saw earlier and what you've been graciously helping us understand the nuance of and the needs for developing core message, speaking to the IPRTF, its establishment, vision, history, key accomplishments, its focus now and how people can engage. Revising content on the task force website uh, in the short term, again, creating a fact style content that ties to key initiative content, increasing content access points, developing a standalone presentation template for use whenever any of you are speaking publicly to this work. Next slide. And then in terms of uh, campaigns. So we understand from the county that there has been uh, adopted an official name change for the Ann Deacon Center for Hope. And our recommendation is that you lean into that branding. Um, again, we're focusing on a broader community and anywhere where you have the word hope is a wonderful thing. Um, rather than the wonky technical name of what the facility is. So there would need to be some um, branding alignment around that to kind of transition and get people to understand that these two things are one in the same. And that is something that we would help you with. 
Um, and we believe that this is a really strong opportunity for a campaign effort, a mini campaign effort that we actually might be able to tie into some message test testing to get a peek at how it does. But um, so clarifying and implementing consistent branding, utilizing the campaign framework to develop assets for and activate the campaign effort, including press release, op-ed, toolkit, partner engagement and activation, and again, those increased website access points. We've, we've noticed that there's information, wonderful information all over the, the county's website, but there are some also external websites that have great information um, about some of the work that's being done as well. And we'd like to be able to seamlessly tie those together. Next slide. For the, did somebody say something? Okay, for the second campaign, so two campaigns and Deacon Center for Hope, and then the second campaign uh, is the co-responder model. And I think that we can actually expand that um, to talk about alternative response I think just in all the ways you have augmented um, what would be a traditional law enforcement response in Whatcom County is a wonderful opportunity for a campaign. And, you know, we're no strangers to opposition research. We're no strangers to the challenges that happen in community around public safety, around defund around how the pendulum swings back and forth, which you all are describing, and the nuances and challenges um, of consistently communicating these things uh, as moving forward in a positive way. And one of the things that we have found and believe Whatcom County is primed for that helps move communities forward in these efforts is things like press releases and op-eds that feature voices of law enforcement leadership paired with other influential voices in community that work in human services, mental health, community health services, et cetera. So that would be our um, second campaign recommendation. And then next slide. Alternatives to incarceration. This is more um, messaging recommendation developing developing messaging, speaking to the key initiative, featuring examples and proof points like lead, grace, and home detention. And next, supporting services for communities. So things like um, men's low intensity um, treatment housing, again, developing messages that speak to this kind of key uh, initiative. Within these things, we, they're, uh, begins to be a story of continuity of care and systems and support for residents in Whatcom County, whether they are, you know, um, involved in the criminal legal system or not presently. Next slide. And then part five, I'll just dive into this because it kind of ties to what I was just showing you, is what we're recommending for messaging testing when we have the messaging fully developed. Begin by testing core themes and value-driven frames for overarching messaging, speaking to this transformative work as a whole, to the IPR TF's mission and Ann Deacon Center for Hope. We want to start with developing a modest initial campaign effort focused on the Ann Deacon Center for Hope and activate with a focus on tracking engagement with and reactions to the content shared. So a focus on social, activation through organic and paid presence, and Emily can speak to what these words actually mean. Pursue in community postering with QR code to learn more. Place an op-ed or two uh, to understand broad reactions and engagement with the content speaking to active work in motion and results. So kind of encapsulating that, we would take the uh, some of the assets that we're act actually developing for you for a campaign 
and use some of those in message testing. We can do focus groups, but more than just a focus group of people and how do you respond to these words and how do you engage with these things, we want to really kind of inject this into the ethers and be able to track and see where it goes and how people interact with the messages on um, an organic level, depending on where they see it. If they see a poster in community that has a code they can click on that takes them somewhere, that tells us a lot. Um, and we can even, you know, to a certain extent, follow where they go from there with the information. So we think we will absolutely be able to learn a great deal from this that will inform your communications engagement going forward. Emily? Yeah, that was great, Sakara. Thank you. I think the only thing that I would add to it is just that in that initial message testing, starting with the whole gives us an opportunity to really test that um, values-based connection and whether we're hitting it and who we're hitting it with. Um, testing messages around the IPRTF submission specifically helps us understand the extent to which people are understanding the uh, our word choice and phrasing and how we speak to this group's work in particular. And then message testing around the Ann Deacon Center for Hope feels like it would give us an opportunity to test messaging around something that um, that speaks to an accomplishment and action and something that's been implemented and has outcomes. So that's, you know, what we're trying to strike the balance of with those three areas of focus for message testing. Um, and then as a Christ, I just think it'll be really powerful to be able to start with broader focus groups, see how people are, you know, kind of generally reacting, and then to move through an initial focus campaign effort to understand how that translates um, into whether or not we can drive people to take action once we've learned a bit from the focus groups and then some initial message refinement. Arlene. My question is, what is, how do you message test? What does that mean? So message testing, you know, so there's different kinds of message testing. You can get a focus group of people together and get a baseline. Uh, you have to figure out, first of all, what it is that you want from the message testing. So going off the top of my head, if I were going to get a people, uh, community members from Whatcom County together and ask some questions, I would probably start with a baseline questionnaire to ask them, what what things they are already aware of? What, what are things that they know about? Do they know what the Ann Deacon Center for Hope is? Have they heard of it before? What do they know about it? And then we would present them with um, factual information and then ask them a series of questions to get their reactions from it. And often we're having a discussion just like this where people saying, I don't like that word, or this should be here instead, or how come you haven't addressed this, or, you know, um, this is not in a language that I'm comfortable reading in. Do you have it in another language? We get all kinds of feedback from that. And actually um, placing things like an op-ed, we learn a lot from that, especially if we can sneak in a QR code is kind of those things that they use in restaurants now as a menu that you can pull up on your phone. We can point people to another access point and figure out how many of them are going there. So let's just say we have a, a, an op-ed in a newspaper in Whatcom County with a QR code for people to learn more information. First of all, we understand the numbers of readership um, just from that publication. Then we get to see how many people are accessing that code and being driven to the next piece of information that we are giving them? And then are they taking it even further? Are they sharing it? Um, are they sending, are they forwarding an email? Are they sharing it on social media? Uh, it just, it kind of depends. And we wanna try and learn a little bit of everything for Whatcom County. We wanna learn how message resonates and we wanna learn a little bit more about how people access message and then what they do with it after that. So we only have uh, the Bellingham Herald and uh, Cascadia, this new little 
newspaper. So I, I think most of the community don't, don't get those newspapers. Anymore. Well, we have a specialist that um, focuses on media channels. And so you probably have a lot more media channels <laughs> than you are aware of. There are community blogs, community newspapers. You know, we would look at uh, the Spokane Review. We would look at all kinds of different, you know, we have ways to look and see where are the people in Whatcom County um, getting their primary news from and how can we put things in front of them. And then the other option is just putting things in high traffic places where we know people go. So if we're postering or doing a bus ad or something like that, we can get you know, a great deal of information just from that. And I think the last thing we have with just a very few minutes left, um, Emily, is the next steps. Um, Emily will speak to the work plan and timeline. We are going to focus on going back and revising and developing messaging based on what we've heard from you here today, probably have a conversation with Jill in the near future about um, how, if at all, to address uh, to the best of our ability, these absolutely prescient issues that you wanna be able to communicate about the circumstance of the jail while maintaining the scope of work that we currently have. Um, so I'll have just Emily go over the work plan and timeline very quickly, and then we'll get to Dan and Steven. Sure. Um, so opening this link here, maybe what we can do is just kind of overview our current thinking on how the phases of work can roll, generally speaking. Um, so in July, we moved through a lot of discovery work, um, built our understanding of what has taken place to date and what we have to build from spending time with you all in August here. Um, our hope is that we can move through most of the narrative and message development in August and September, move through testing in September and October and be Are really fine. The... Oh, yes. Let me fix that. Different desktop. Okay, here we go. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so moving through narrative and message development um, in September and October, hopefully doing um, testing in alongside that timeline and then finalizing messaging by the end of October. We will be doing a bit of a needs assessment that we've already started and is ongoing in tandem in October as well. Um, and then we will also be building out the communications and community engagement plan. And you've seen the start at that today. So that will be created in tandem with messaging so that once we've tested messaging and we have it finalized and feel good about it, that we're ready to go and clear on our strategies for implementing it. Um, and then finally, once we have completed uh, the development of our plan and messaging and have those assets in place in October and November, we would move into creating some of the assets for implementation. And we know that one of the things that's really important there is a toolkit um, to activate the messaging and the strategy that we've put together um, and to do some training on implementation. And, um, and we can do that in November and December. I've also talked with Jill about and feel completely flexible if based on schedules and end of year stuff, if it's easier to move that over into January, we're happy to talk about that as well. So in broad strokes, kind of by month, that's how we're thinking about the sequencing of the work. Thanks, Emily. Dan? Yeah, just wanted to put this on your radar screen. There's a, um, a website called Respond Whatcom that Chuck Nut Health Foundation has put out and they have uh, a link that says our programs and they have the grace program, the lead program, the, you know, you can go look and see. So just be aware of that. The other, I um, hope your channel manager is considering um, Instagram, Reddit, um, my wife's coworkers, I'll get their local news off of that. Um, next door, although I can't stand that website, but I think people access it. And, um, and then um, Emily, you said something about, um, uh, people getting this information then and then taking action. I'm wondering what what that looks like to you and how do you measure it? Yeah, so our initial thinking is that what we could do is in one of the campaigns that Sakara was speaking to, an early effort, do some initial, like a mini campaign effort to start 
and do some testing before we went broader scale. So right now we envision that showing up on um, organic social channels and also doing some paid social and in community postering. And what we would do is likely include a QR code or a link to call to take action that would drive people back to that centralized space um, in Whatcom County's digital channels that would speak more broadly to the work and everything in motion. So the, the goal there is understanding, you know, we will have done message testing through focus groups already to understand if it's resonating. That helps us then see and understand as we look across social channels and the ones that you mentioned and beyond, as we look at in community postering, um, what are the channels that seem to be best reaching people and then in, and inspiring them to actually click to take action um, and how many people are clicking and taking action is our messaging you know doing more than resonating is it inspiring people to learn more I just want to follow up real quick I, I think leading with the Ann Deacon Center for Hope is is a great move really really brilliant so good on you thank you for doing that that's great yeah thank you the other thing I would say Dan is you know action is broadly defined Sometimes the action is just click here for more information. So we're driving them somewhere. But the other thing that we could do in the fall as an action thing is, you know, uh, um, click here to um, put, put the next um, IPRF full task force meeting, join the next task force meeting in October or November, and then see how many people show up you know what i mean or see how many people have just clicked on it there's there's a whole series of we clicked on it we put it on our calendar and then how many people actually showed up to it but again it just tells you a lot about how people are interacting with the information that you're giving them and if they are taking that opportunity to say okay yeah i want to learn more about this absolutely uh steven and then raylene yeah, uh, this is probably in your head, Sakara, and yours, Emily, but I thought it would be safer to articulate it. Um, some of the uh, primary messaging and sub-messaging uh, didn't look to me like it had been uh, vetted for reading level or educational level. Correct. And it, it seems to me that it needs to be downgraded, or at least there need to be different forms. And, and I think that's especially true when you compare uh print media versus some of the social media communications um similarly there are also analogs i mean an op-ed piece and a print suggests print media to me but there could be versions of similar kinds of communications in social media and i hope we're capturing all of those um so just wanted to put that out there absolutely I just wanted to say thank you. I also want to um, real quick ask if it's possible maybe when we get into this interaction with the public is if we could maybe do a survey monkey. What have you learned from this? What more do you want to know? Uh, not a whole lot of questions, but some feedback from those that are clicking on it might be an option. Um, but if you guys don't agree with that, please, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Um, second is if I can Father Stephen and Jill, after this meeting is over for about 60 seconds, I'd appreciate it. Jill. Just to quickly, and this is more for Barry, I think, unfortunately, Perry and Jackie Mitchell aren't here today. In terms of branding for the Ann Deacon Center, we're going to need to get health department, specifically Erica, on board to do with that, since that's all their purview. Um, so Barry maybe be thinking about how we can talk to Erica about doing that. Um, Emily and Sakar, are you comfortable forwarding me this presentation so I can forward it on to our members here and they can take a look at it after the fact and, and maybe any additional comments they can send to you through me and. Yes, absolutely. Awesome, thank you. Well, everybody, uh, quite a, quite a 96 minute journey we had. Uh, I really appreciated it. Uh, do you guys have anything more you want to add before we sign off? Jack? Oh, okay. You're just waving goodbye. I was waving goodbye. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. One foot out you, the door. Okay. <laughs> you two probably got 
a feeling of a little pushback here, but I just want to say I think what you've been presenting is really super um, and you're definitely on the right track. I'm sorry we are so talkative and into the weeds on some of this. We, yeah, we're, we're, we can be rabbit well. holers, but we, you know, we there's always great ideas that come out of rabbit holes. So we see we see it as excavation. So I like the rabbit hole analogy. It's yeah. not, it's just the excavation to get it down to it. I mean, what we're going through reading everything is almost a theoretical exercise. And it's not until we get into a room and have actual conversation that we're able to better understand and thread these things together. So thank you all so much. Yeah, very, it's really, appreciate very rich it. discussion. Okay, folks, we'll see you all later. Uh, those are staying behind. You stay behind. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you Thanks so much. All. Appreciate the time.